First, I'll read uh, Marvin Couldn't Come. He wanted to very much, but uh, he wrote this for me to read for him. In the fall term of 1950, I arrived as a new graduate student in the mathematics department at Princeton University and shortly fell into the company of senior researchers like John Tukey, Solomon Lefschitz, John von Neumann, and graduate students like John Nash, Martin Schubick, Lloyd Shapley, and John McCarthy, who all became lifelong comrades in life and research. <clears throat> Both McCarthy and I were interested in classical math subjects like logic and topology. John's doctoral thesis was about rotated vector fields and mine was about the logic of machines. But both of us were mainly concerned with machines, with making machines that could reason and learn. <clears throat> we both joined Claude Shannon at Bell Labs in the summer of 1952 and in a very preliminary way began to plan a future symposium on artificial intelligence. Later that year, McCarthy moved to become a professor of mathematics at Dartmouth, but we continued to discuss the future of computers and that first formal conference on the artificial intelligence on artificial intelligence was finally realized at Dartmouth in 1956 organized by McCarthy. Throughout all this, John and I had both agreed that to make smarter machines would eventually need massive collections of common sense knowledge. However, we had different ideas about representing that knowledge. John preferred to develop formal, logically consistent representations, which led him to develop the LISP programming language, whereas I was more concerned with pragmatic learning from experience. But despite the fact that we had such different approaches, in 1958, Jerome Wiesner, the director of MIT's Research Laboratory of Electronics, helped the two of us to start what eventually became MIT's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Now, you might expect that if two co-directors of the same project had such different goals, this would lead to serious conflicts. Yet, I cannot recall this ever happening perhaps because we both understood that both approaches were needed. Accordingly, whenever the two of us disagreed, we rarely attempted to compromise. Instead, one of us would simply walk away, leaving the other one to decide. Only in much later years did I recognize how many brilliant technical and managerial decisions McCarthy had made in those early times, and I cannot remember a single case of such a decision going badly wrong. During those early years, our families grew up together with many outings, adventures, and potluck dinners. John accepted a tenured position at Stanford in 1962, and though we were no longer in such close touch and continued pursuing those different approaches, we remained good friends and colleagues over the years. And over those decades and thousands of miles, our children, Margaret, Julie, and Henry have remained friends with Susan and Sarah McCarthy. Those who know only John's technical writing might be surprised to learn that he was usually sparkly and cheerful and full of interesting stories and facts and puzzles. While his formal scientific papers tend to be clear and concise, his website shows some very respectable social essays and science fiction stories. I'm so sorry to not be here to honor John, to say these words in person. I really miss John McCarthy, one of my very closest friends and colleagues.